Welcome to Studio Visits with Silver Eye, where I get to talk in depth with some of the most interesting contemporary photographers working today. I'm David Oresik, the Executive Director of Silver Eye Center for Photography. You can visit us online at silvereye.org to learn more about our programs, and you can find a helpful glossary for these conversations. In this episode, I spoke with Odette England. Odette uses photography, sculpture, collage, performance, writing, and the archive to explore themes of land, gender, and ritual. She often manipulates her negatives and prints, intervening with their surfaces and experimenting with expired film, broken cameras, and tainted chemistry. Odette is currently the artist-in-residence at Amherst College. In September 2021, St. Lucie Books will publish England's second monograph, dairy character. Odette and I got to talk about her growing up in her parents' farm in rural South Australia, how dairy farming framed her sense of gender roles, and her dark and cutting sense of humor. Enjoy this studio visit with Odette England. Odette England, welcome to Studio Visits with Silver Eye. Thanks for, thanks for doing this with us. Thank you for the invitation. This is going to be great fun. So we're, we're really excited to be showing some work from the first chapter of your book, The Long Shadow which is called Dairy Character. This work covers a lot of ground and, and talks about a lot of stuff, but there was a line from your artist statement that I actually just kind of wanted to, to read uh, for the first question that I think really struck me. And, and you know, when I was reviewing this work, I really underlined it, which you, you said, well, and it, I guess to set this up a little bit, it should also be mentioned, you, you grew up on a dairy farm in, in South Australia. And in your artist statement, you say, from childhood, I understood that men did, quote, the work, and love their land, and that women supported this work and loved their men, thus fulfilling a domestic ideal. Even so, we were expected to honor, know, and do male labor on demand while relegated to performing, quote, female. So that, I guess, encapsulated a lot of the idea of, of what gender identity and gender roles meant in this community. Can you tell us about kind of where you grew up and, and how these gender roles were were showed to you? In terms of where I grew up, it's a very small, isolated farming community in Southern Australia where, and largely male occupied, there's about 60 people who lived there when I did. There were first, second, third generation farmers. There were several immigrant families from the Netherlands and Ireland and Germany, and they were all dairy farmers. And our farmhouses were sandwiched between the sand hills on one side and the Murray River on the other side, which is Australia's largest. And so growing up there, there were no surfaced roads, no shops, no taxis, no cinemas. So there was this extended prolonging of childhood on the one hand, but also a very early direct learning of what labour was. And I grew up knowing that information and experience was stored in our muscles and our hands which helped us to troubleshoot and to be resourceful and they're actually now primary attributes uh, in my practice but growing up there you know we, we we grew what we needed you rarely threw anything away if someone needed something and we had it we gave it if someone's cows got out it was everyone's problem to solve but within this kind of collaborative extended family, I was also very aware of being a girl and what that meant for me labor wise. And that meant learning to cook and clean and sew and to know my place, my physical place, my geographical place in this community. I was a firstborn daughter and that was unusual in this community. So I was also assigned tasks that perhaps I wouldn't have been otherwise like learning to drive dad's truck when I was about nine years old. How did you how did you begin to think about showing some of these gender dynamics? You know, when, when you decided you wanted to kind of think about this through your artwork, how did you choose to sort of image these ideas? That's a great question. And I think it's probably worth giving a little backstory to how I found them because, you know, I had on my studio wall a selection of about 90 small prints, images that I'd made of my daughter, images that I directed my parents to make at the farm. There were some family snapshots. There were some found images. And every day I was in the studio, I would sit in front of this wall and just think and look. And when I had studio visits, I'd talk about this remote dairy farming community and my obsession with re-performing autobiography. But I knew there was a hole 
in what was on the wall. I knew it was a me-shaped hole Hmm. and that the dirt to fill it would only come when I was ready to be more vulnerable but also much more critical of this place that I love. And so in the Australian summer of 2019, I was visiting my parents and as soon as they leave the house, I go back to being a great big kid and I start looking in their drawers in their cupboards. I start looking for things that might become a source of inspiration. And it was rummaging in their understair cupboard that I came across my dad's old confirmation assessment manual. It's a cow manual. It's given to all registered dairy farmers. And the job of this manual is to help the farmer rank, rate and assess the physical strengths and weaknesses of their female dairy cows. And it does that by talking about production of milk and reproduction of calves. And these manuals are typically, you know, they're written by men. The photographs in them are taken by men. And I was flicking through the pages and I realised how sexist and demeaning and derogatory the language is. Uh, The images are very invasive, very crass, very unflattering. And I thought about how this production reproduction life cycle also relates to photography. And in those 15 minutes of sneaking around and finding this book, which I actually write about in Dairy Character as a process, I realized that my snoopiness and my curiosity had allowed me to find the shovel and the dirt that I needed to fill this hole that was was in my work that I was seeing on the studio wall. So this manual sort of became yeah, I love that metaphor of the shovel and the dirt. It, it sort of becomes like, I mean, the way I was thinking about it, I guess, is it becomes this like document that sort of stands in for a metaphor for the treatment of women in, in kind of the entire society, right? I mean, it, it's literally talking about the cows, but I, I think that you began to sort of extend that metaphor into how how the women in the community were treated as their value was determined you know, as their capacity uh, as mothers. Is that right? That's true. And while I was making this work and sequencing the pictures, I was also reading The Sexual Politics of Meat, which helped me frame some of how I was coming about it. Because actually in working on Dairy Character entirely, I read a lot about women and farming, books like Preserving the Family Farm and with these hands and I found myself wanting to to point out that even now it's not just rural females but that was my focus rural females just they don't share fully in the occupational inheritance of agriculture at all they're frequently excluded and marginalized from important resources and knowledge part of the reason for that exclusion is still the result of ongoing social processes of patriarchal culture which is something that is talked about at length in this book, The Sexual Politics of Meat. And because this, you know, agriculture is a social a social construction and it's reinforced by certain types of myth-making while at the same time working to disadvantage rural girls and women. And so I wanted to create a new kind of record or a new kind of document that I hadn't seen or read before in a photo book that made palpable, really palpable, the emotional quotient of growing up girl when the loudest, strongest voices just didn't sound like mine. How did you begin to think about, you know, using images that you're making of your daughter, images that you're finding and images from this kind of like uh, text (laughs) that's kind of guiding that, you know, how did you begin to to think about combining these three sources together, Which, which, you know, in some ways feels like a really daunting thing to think about it, but it comes together so elegantly. Well, that's very nice of you to say, because for the longest of times, it felt very unwieldy. And so much of so much of farm life is about gesture and about nonverbal communication, right? It's about the simplicity and the economy of words. There's like a distinct lack of adjectives. You don't over explain anything because there's no need. And there's an emphasis on what's concrete, useful and down to earth. And so in terms of ordering and sequencing and bringing disparate, seemingly disparate elements together, and even linguistically, both in just making the work and and choosing family snapshots in particular to include, and even in the writing, 
I thought a lot about the dialect of dairy farming, the mm. way female cows are described in these manuals, about the kinds of images that I needed to repeat or features within images that needed to recur. So a lot of them speak to dust or to dryness. They speak to looking down or looking up. You know, as a farmer, there are two things that are always on your mind. They're the weather and the soil, in addition to your girls, the cows. And, you know, as a kid, I don't remember having a horizontal flat view of things. I, I don't remember looking straight ahead. It was always up or down. So this became a, rep a repetitive visual theme, but also a, a sequencing mechanism for how different images came together. You know, there's also a lot of suns, there's a lot of burning holes, like when you stare at the sun and you get those little spots before your eyes and then things become blurry. Mm. And so blur and grain were important too, where you almost start to blink because you're thinking, am I seeing parts of girls that look like cows or vice versa? And I suppose the other thing to say is that life at the farm was also very much about repair and about tactile values. So there are images that are forlorn or broken or that look haphazard or disheveled in some way. And I thought a lot about how to use the camera and use sequencing to talk about tactility. It was, it felt so important and especially photographing my daughter and just thinking about bodies, like what, what things are placed onto our bodies by other people, by history, by ancestry. And I kept asking myself, what was placed onto my body that informed the, the backstory to dairy character? You know, how are, how are female bodies implements? How do we become implements that men try to manipulate in different ways? And, you know, perhaps, perhaps actually the book is like this acknowledgement of my inability to find the kind of femaleness that I so desperately wanted in a place that I love to this day but that my understanding of femaleness was covered, was, was entirely, not entirely, was somewhat coloured by what men told me it was. And so many of the images of the book are, are tinted kind of metaphorically with that complication and what it means to visually touch something versus physically touch someone. I, I, I mean, I, I think that is something, you know, that, that, that becomes so interesting is this, this, I think that you're alluding to is this kind of generational idea in this project, right? That you, you know, your, your father mostly, I think, you know, it has a big presence and his influence on you. And then you returned with your daughter, who I think is a, a young teenager at the time you're shooting, or maybe a bit younger. So I was, I was wondering, you know, how has motherhood kind of made you think about these, you know, this idea of like how women are raised, which I think is, is really interesting and important. And then why did you want to, to photograph your daughter? Right. Motherhood has entirely changed and also informed in the most surprising of ways how I not only think about my work and, and come at my work, but also what I'm responsible for in my work and photographing Hepburn, that's my daughter, has always been a collaborative venture. She's now 10 and I photo started photographing her for this project when she was five or six years old. I've always asked her permission. I don't coerce or pressure her. If she doesn't feel like being photographed, I, I respect that. Actually, oftentimes she'll make suggestions through her behavior or through moving her body in a particular way. And she'll say, mom, what about this? Or can you photograph me doing this? And I always show her all the images that I like. If she's uncertain or uncomfortable, I don't use them. I ask her opinion. And actually I learned something through the process of asking that. And, you know, she's a person with feelings and preferences and that word family, which I think about a lot in context of this work, shouldn't be an excuse or a reason or a blind spot that makes it okay for me to be disrespectful you know she's not a model she's not a muse and certainly for dairy character where I was hoping to make photographs that made her character seem monumental you know my photographic wish was to kind of convey this female character that would literally be looked up to like those photographs that Alexander Rachenko made for young pioneers I love that Hepburn becomes this 
character where she's she's almost like a sunflower trying to find the sun and I love that yeah I, I really wanted I really wanted that to be visually present I well I, I love the I love the thinking about it through those kind of Rachenko uh, photos because I think that actually makes a, a lot of the image choices you know kind of kind of become clear for me where like there's something really heroic, you know. I'm thinking um, specifically of the the don't stare at the fun uh, the sun photo, which does have this kind of you know low vantage point, um, you know, finding finding the sun like a sunflower, um, you know. And and I guess to me, you know, it, it it probably you know to me it kind of begins to speak to that like intergenerational promise of like as parents like trying to do better by the next generation, which I think and. You know, when I think about, you know, that is probably like every generation of parents thinks that and thinks they're doing it, even if they <laughs> uh, don't don't quite hit the mark, right? <laughs> which I which I think is uh, bringing those in. Um, I guess the the other you know the, the other part of the that coin that I was kind of thinking about is some of just the other like either they're found or like family photos of kind of rural women that again, have a, have a very like confident kind of empowered and like, like there's a lot of pleasure that like, you know, is like seen in, in some of these women's, you know, when I'm thinking of uh, this photo um, outward or a photo of a kind of woman laying on a haystack, kind of like touching it. How are you thinking, you know, are these, are these, are these found photos from the family archive? Or are they just from uh, things that you've happened across? Like, how are you finding them? And then what are you looking for when you're, when you're looking through archival photos? I'm always looking through archival images, both as a, as a resource for ideas, for inspiration, for context. And it's a straightforward process when I know what I'm looking for. <laughs> but to get to know what I'm looking for, it just, for me, takes a lot of testing of my eye and experimenting how one image sits next to another, talking to myself, negotiating with what I want from an image versus what it will be, you know, regardless of my wishes for it. But in selecting, in, in looking at those particular family snapshots, and most of them are from the family archive, I kept in the back of my mind, you know, how do I as an artist become, and a, and a mother and someone who grew up in this community become a conduit for talking about rural females through recontextualizing these images that are not always polished, are not always camera ready. We're not even always sure of exactly what's happening in the image. Like how can, how can these snapshots that were intended to be snapshots, they weren't intended to be for the purposes of, of, of art. How can they be a kind of outlet to the experiences of other rural females. So I, I very purposely tried to select those where that reflected our life there. You know, our life there wasn't glossy or neat. It was very gritty. It was very authentic. But in saying that, in hearing myself say that, that the authenticity was tuned into a very gendered channel with a one-ray receiver. So that's why images like the haystack image, for example, became really important to include because there's a sense that there's, it could be funny, but it, that it depends what kind of funniness you're using as your lens to view that image. And especially when it comes directly after an image of a male hand pointing down. So what does that kind of conversation skew or distort or complicate or defy by that relationship happening? And similarly, the image of, I think it's my great aunt, who is next to a truck and she's seemingly like in a position of, of, of great authority and power, but, and it's a complete image, it's not a crop. But my question for most of the images that I've chose, that I chose was also what was happening outside of that frame conversation wise that's not included in that image. And that's why adding text to this book in the center of the book felt so important because I could start to talk about some of those complications about the edges and the borders and the boundaries of what happens outside of a photograph that says something very different to what happens inside of it. Yeah, I, I mean, just yes, first of all. Um, I, I, I think uh, 
You know what, I'm, I'm so glad you mentioned the, the sense of humor in this project because I think, you know, I think that's one of the things I like the most about it, but I think it's one of the hardest things to describe about it because there are just a lot of like layers and levels, I think, to the, to the wit, right? I mean, there's just sort of the kind of absurd level comparing women's bodies to cows' bodies. And I think that uh, comes through in a number of, of ways and, and it's, you know, I, I, I often find myself going through the process of like, kind of like, that's funny. And then kind of thinking like, that's not funny, that's awful. Why would you think that's funny? And you know, I think it, it really challenges a lot of a, a lot of uh, a lot of I'll say my perhaps some other people in an audience like kind of notions of humor and like what's acceptable. And then I think that third level after sort of like that is like, oh, that's like dark. Like that's dark. <laughs> you know, like there's a real a real kind of darkness to that wit. And I, I think that is like really taken to the next level with the texts you've chosen to, to put in with these pictures, you know, and, and things that are like, um, you know, the, this slide where it's kind of talking about blindness and kind of eye problems with the, with the cows and, you know, what, the, you know, you could imagine, right, of, of course, that's an important thing for farmers to notice, I guess, if their cows can see or not, but like thinking about this as, as photography, as perceptions of, of gender roles as, as all these things that kind of the eye is important for. So I, I don't know, yeah, I, I guess my, if you if you wanna talk a little bit more about like how you chose that that text and image pairing. So much of the, the confirmation assessment manual just speaks to physical attributes and in this instructional, direct, clinical, factual way where the beasts are graded from, you know, good or great or best to worst, worrisome, concerning. And within that are all of these shades of, of grey. And I didn't set out to make pictures based on what the text told me. I made pictures instinctively of my daughter performing or enacting a role or moving her body in a certain way and then would think about what text not necessarily illustrated that because I didn't want there to be a direct relationship but rather either conflicted with it or turned it into a different kind of discussion of the things that we look for in a photograph that a photograph might amplify for us versus what recedes away without text being a kind of anchor, which I always think of, of text being. And that's the same way that I treated the way in which I wrote about some of the images in the center of the book and how I decided to include stories of my past because there, I think there are 18 or so short stories. They're each about 300 words long. And they all sit in the center of the book. So it's like this exposing at the core of something or getting to the heart of something, you know, you're literally looking inside. And very early on, I felt that some of what I wanted to say about farming and gender and relationships between text and image was better suited just to images while other parts needed text. And my writing in the book slips between third person and first person. Sometimes I write as my dad, sometimes I write as my mum without indicating that that's what I'm doing. Sometimes I include actual emails from my parents. Sometimes I include actual text from the manuals. It's very visceral and immediate and improv and kind of scatty, um, which is exactly, I think, too, how some of the images present and how life on the farm actually was. You mentioned earlier about it being you know, on the one hand dark and then on the one hand lovely and then thinking, oh no, that's just super uncomfortable or super strange. That's what, that's what this community was like. It was this wonderful and challenging combination of extremes and opposites. You know, it was magical and limiting and fun and hard work. And those differences and those extremes I felt needed to be present both in the way images and text came together, but also in text as a form and image as a form within its own, within their own right. Well, I haven't had the chance to, to see the full book yet. Like I can't wait um, to get my hands on it, but 
I was really interested, you know, one thing I was thinking about, you know, just preparing for this conversation was you mentioned writing from the perspective of your parents and having emails from your parents. You know, what is that perspective of your parents like, you know, in, in terms of um, how you understand it or like what you actually know about it? I showed them this project only a couple of months ago. I tend to work on something for a period of time and then I'll, I'll reveal it. <laughs> And they loved it. They, they thought they were surprised, I think, at just how much I remembered because I was 14 years old when we left and when we had to leave. And but so much of what I hang on to in terms of memory and in embedding those, embedding those memories into the work that I make comes from that time period. So I'm always I've always involved them in everything that I do because they're not only participants in it, they're actors, they're producers, they contribute to so much of the work that I make. I've, I asked them to comment on snapshots that I included in this edit. I asked them for feedback on images that I included of Hepburn. So they have a collaborative part to play in this too, even though I'm, I'm criticising visually, textually criticising this place and some of the happenings around it. What what do they make of that criticism? <laughs> I feel like my dad would say that's fairly typical of me and my mum would say, good for you. <laughs> <laughs> we were, I was talking to mum and dad only, I speak to them almost every week and I was telling them about this book by Lewis Hyde. It's called A Primer for Forgetting and I've, I reread it every few months and I was quoting to mum and dad something that Lewis says in this book, that if you want to secure a lie, you need to surround it with a moat of forgetfulness. And I think for the longest of times, my head as an artist was turned towards some kind of rosy glow of nostalgia about our farm and our community. And like hovering in that glow made me forget some of the realities of what this lifestyle was really like. And so finding dad's cow manual, talking to them about it, involving them in it became both a bridge that crossed the moat, but also like one of those big bug zappers, right? It killed off a lot of the romanticism and I'm super grateful of that. Yeah, because um, yeah. I mean, the, the work isn't, I, I was trying to sort of think of where this work occupies in terms of like, because there's a lot of beauty in the work, but it's not necessarily romantic or nostalgic either. Uh, and I, I just think that's like a kind of a, just a, a you just, I guess I don't think of a lot of work as occupying that kind of territory or that like that space between like thinking about the past unnostalgically but but beautifully it it uh which I again I, I think is also tied to that complex use of humor in the work too right and to go back to something you said the word cut I think it was which I in the back of my mind as we've been talking, I've been thinking about just that word is that even the word cut or inscribe is it, 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 it creates a scar, right? And some scars are very visible and some are not. And I think it's because I refuse to abandon my past generally because it's made me who I am, but at the same time, because I'm not willing to accept it either. I feel like I have to make photographs or collect photographs about it and in doing that and putting them into a form like Derry character, I'm recreating it. And I'm aware that as I'm saying all of this, I'm actually paraphrasing Louise Bourgeois because she would talk about this idea of recreating and reworking that which is behind us and somehow that propels the story forward in new ways, still accurate ways, but also fictionalised ways. And it allows us to separate ourselves from autobiography to some extent or to tether our to create a kind of tethering where we can be much more critical, but with still with a very loving eye. Yeah, I mean, and, you know, I was thinking about just your, like a, a project that is so collaborative, right? That has your parents' involvement and has your daughter's kind of involvement and, and a lot of kind of eyes on this experience that, that you're sort of talking to from your perspective, but obviously, you know, people were there too. And I, I always I always wonder about, you know, like, I guess I was kind of wondering, you know, in a different way, I'm, I'm thinking about this project in a, in a kind of different context that maybe I hadn't before, which is in the sort of grand tradition of like photographs about people's families for everyone from like 
Larry Salton or um, Sally Mann or um, Latoya Ruby Frazier, like these kind of intense investigations of like where you're from and like who are these people who who raised me and like why did they make the choices they made? Did you think about that kind of photographic history while you were making it, or or, or is that you know am I am I just kind of projecting my own thing here? <laughs> no, I did. I mean, I, I can. <laughs> As soon as you said Sally Mann, I can hear that quote in my head about us not being able to make photographs without imposing ourselves onto them. So even if I wanted to be at arm's length from this, I don't think that would have been possible. I mean, it's it's resolutely autobiographical, but there isn't a single photograph of me in here. The way I appear is, of course, as an artist, but but mostly as a as a writer and a and a collator, perhaps. But I think. You know, the whole time when I was trying to put elements together, look at other artists who have thought about family and Larry Sultan's work is, is some that I think about, Pictures from Home is, is one I think about a lot, is that I also wanted to think about how things like how I was dressed and presented at the farm, why that was the case and how that was presented back to me through photography because that's how I understand it not just through memory but it was also presented back to me through snapshots that my mother made certainly not my father my mother was the the snap shooter and images where that seem to make the boys seem like gold and the girls seem decorative and so it became a, an exercise of, of filling the gaps of where family said one thing through snapshots and what was left out of that what was left out of that conversation. So like I knew, for instance, I wanted Im an image of my dad's truck because it's a key character and I saw it as a masculine character. I knew I wanted an image of our driveway because that feels like a masculine character and, and a family and a familial character. And then some, so some of the photographs were knowns and some of them I treated very in a very gendered light and some of them I treated as family members. But then there were others that were more serendipitous, like the image of the dead owl, which is a, a male owl. So every image, you know, it had to be relevant. It had to hold its own, just like a family member tries to in a conversation. It had to refer backwards and forwards to other images in the book. And I thought a lot about what what kinds of voices in a, in a photograph linger the longest, not just are the loudest, but linger the longest. And I think some of the best editing advice I've ever received was from Stephen Gill. And I know he doesn't necessarily photograph his family. He said, go with images that have a strong familial content, a strong emotional content. Don't look images, don't overlook images that, that aggravate, you know, try not to ponder or analyze your choices too early, but eliminate anything you have to justify and don't stop until you remove every single piece of doubt. Whereas Cara Buzzle, the designer who I collaborated with closely throughout this project would always say, well, let's stick two pictures together that you wouldn't normally do. Like let's put a family member with a stranger and then see what happens. And I like that because then there's these ex exciting kind of relationships and the surprises that, occur because you're making pairings or groupings that seem you know completely out of sync or that avoid some kind of aesthetic rightness and actually that process helped me to unknow the images and to unknow family members or to unknow places in a really useful way i mean that that process also just strikes me as just like very true to the way photographs exist and in, in a lot of people's families right like you might find a photograph of your mother next to someone else and you just don't know who that person right. is and you know you may be able to ask around and find out and you may not and you know the the kind of increasing increasing loss of context as as photographs age and as the people who were you know in the photographs you know age and uh and and die right like that 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 i mean to me that that idea is just so essential to photography <laughs> that time will you know time will change meeting in, intensely one of the last uh, things I wanted to ask you about was, you know, we were doing some research and, and you talked about in an interview that, that photographs can be social spaces. And I thought that was just a really interesting idea uh, about these kind of places and memories and, and becoming a, a, an idea of a sort of social space within the image, within the photograph. Was, was that influential for putting this project together, putting this book together? Wow. Well, 
I love the idea of a photograph as being a venue or a site that we that we can leave and come back to, but also a space that's so much more active than it is passive. And I think I think the idea of photographs as social spaces is probably one that I borrowed from the writing of Richard Chalfin in his book, Snapshot Versions of Everyday Life, which is an older book now. But in it, he talks about how snapshots and home movies have been used historically within families, how we use them as interaction points or as prompts for storytelling and for a more intimate kind of dialogue. And, you know, I agree with you. I think the meaning of any photograph is always in flux. You know, sometimes the more we look at it, the less we know. And that we, we misremember or embellish the facts through them, assuming that there are facts contained in them. And I'm, I'm very interested in that kind of tension, you know, what can and can't be held from a photograph and what we as viewers need to kind of grab and own and squeeze the life from within whatever, the, you know, a photograph is capable of portraying. Because I think, you know, we still like to think of the photograph as being very complete and resolute and of the world and that its edges are really definitive, but they're so leaky, you know, and I love them for that. Well, I love that idea, the leaky edged photograph. So from, from what you said before, I understand that you had left kind of rural farming life uh, at around 14. So a lot of this idea about, you know, a lot of what you're doing in this book is kind of reflecting on kind of the, a, a very early stage in your life. I guess, what has that process of reflection been like for you uh, now that, you know, your, your life is, is obviously quite different. You don't live on a farm anymore and haven't for a long time. Right. It's something I think about a lot because geographically I'm 17 and a half thousand miles away from this farm that my family loved and lost and that we still love, that I have been revisiting it almost every year for the past 15 or 16 years. And every time I go back, I have to ask permission because it invariably it's owned by someone new. And so I have to re-explain the story. And every time I re-explain the story, it actually becomes slightly funnier too. So that's, there's a way that humour comes back in of me saying, hi, I used to live here this number of years ago. I would like to take some photographs. Can I come and shoot on this land? And, but I'm also, you know, having been away from it, I'm no longer part of that community. I am at arm's length and then two lots of arm's length. And then now, you know, continents away from this community. And I have to seek permission to almost drive down the hill and to prime myself for coming into my past from farmers who still live there, who are still friends with my parents, who think of my parents as being geographically, emotionally, psychologically distant from this place, even though they lived there for, you know, 22 odd years. And so there's this constant reassessment of what does it mean to make this kind of work now living in a city environment when I have to constantly go back and reacquaint myself. So there's this reacquaintance with history and this reacquaintance with physicality and what has happened over the extended period of time of me being away from it. What have I lost through that experience? But one of the, the big things that became aware to me as I was finishing this book is that the differences between rural life and town or city life really only become more pronounced and more profound when you move from one to another. And when I eventually went to the city for high school, culturally, I was miles behind my peers. I mean, they had heard of things and seen things and read things, books, television, art, events, films that I had no clue about. The flip side of that was that I knew how to gut fish and bale hay and whistle to a fox and skin rabbits and change tires and bake pies and light fires without mat matches, all this kind of practical, useful stuff. And so I had to call on that to find my way in a city environment. And I have to now call back to those things when I go back to revisit because they don't come quite as naturally. So telling this story through images I'm making now, but I'm making them rurally places both me, my daughter, and the backstory into a very strange kind of new 
space of narrative that actually doesn't belong. It belongs everywhere, but also nowhere because mm -hmm. there's no fixed place that each of those things come together, except for in the form of this book. And when I, when I landed on that, I was so pleased. It was like, this doesn't tie to any one thing, time, place. And that freedom was really lovely. I, yeah, no, I love that idea of all these, I mean, kind of, you know, in, in a way like survival skills, right? Like knowing, <laughs> knowing, knowing the land, knowing how to live on the land kind of, you know, somewhat harmoniously and, and, and have a, a sense of self-reliance that is, connected to the farm and, and to nature in a way that and then having to catch up on the the kind of skills of culture right you know which which in a way becomes another kind of uh, self-enforcing like gender myth right that the connection to land and nature is a feminine thing and connection to culture is a, is a kind of masculine skill which is a little bit turned on its head from the way you were raised as well Right, and I like that turned on its head because there's a kind of upside downness and inside outness to this work as well, that I had to perform male despite being told to perform female and that I had a place and here was your place, Odette, and this is how you need to behave. But because I was surrounded by so many men, farming men who had done things generation, generationally a certain way, that to behave in that sphere, I had to adapt. I had to stop talking. I had to be invisible and pretend I wasn't listening. But because I'm curious and cheeky, I was constantly, constantly listening in. And as I got older, started to question, well, how come I can't participate in these things? Or why do I have to participate them in them in this square or this rectangle? And so that's why edges and boundaries to me uh, such an important thing to think about both in this work and in an other work I make because I, I was so tired of being restricted but also having to slipstream and, and shape shift my restrictions in order to participate in something else that I was expected to do so I, I became this sort of <laughs> this lumpy puddle that would that would work my way through life as a kid depending on whom who I was with or who I was allowed to be with that is like I think a really universal experience of childhood right like how are you how are you kind of constitute you know how are you creating yourself based on the social situations you find themselves in and they're ever changing and you're trying to please and fit in and also find the thing that is kind of your true authentic self within within all these kind of crazy experiences and you know again it's so specific to you um and to your really unique interesting childhood but I think I think it's a really a universal uh, thing that a lot of people will connect with with this book as well I, I hope so I think we just one of the fundamental needs we all have is just to be seen and to be heard for who we are or who we think we are and being restricted in any way anything that challenges us and our abilities to do that with a certain ease or comfort it is worth talking about, worth shouting about, worth fighting for. And I feel like this book allows me to fight for something that's not nowhere near my own is, is the ability to just present and look the way that we want to look, that photographs will always present us in, in one frame at one moment in one given situation by one person's perspective and onceness is is not enough for me and, and and being stuck in the rigidity of a particular shape based on gender or power or background is certainly not enough for me and i don't think it should be enough for any of us well i think that's a, a great place to wrap um odette england thank you so much for sharing this work today thank you very much um, and thank you to everyone at silver eye for this lovely opportunity to share my work and show it and to make something that's very dear to my heart, much more visible in the world.